Uh, so I'm going to be talking about um, performance uh, user interfaces uh, using CSS magic. So kind of trying to take that magic uh, of CSS and trying to explain what is actually going on and how you can um, they can use the dev tools to measure um, performance and define where performance bottlenecks are, et cetera, and find issues uh, using the different tools we have available. Um, so yeah, I'm Ryan Seddon. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, I did a fun little animation there. It's kind of cool to play with. It works on touch as well. Um, just to show that like um, performance is more than just about uh, HTTP. It's about the user experience and also about uh, how fast you can paint to the screen. So there's the sort of two sides to it. Uh, I'll mostly go into like the, the technical side of it, um, but I'll cover slightly some of the animation side. Um, so animation uh, can improve performance, whether you're a technical person and you like you like you look at the animation, you think, oh, this is really well executed, or you're just a general user and you sort of get some delight out of it. Um, uh, well executed animation r really instills uh, the perception of like a really well performing application, whether that's on the web or on mobile. Uh, and it's not the bad old days of 20 second uh, transitions and flash. It's about like uh, to enhance. Um, the animations and the user experience. Um, a really great example that I've seen is uh, the Stripe checkout uh, page. Um, I've got an animated GIF there. You can see that comes in really nicely and it looks like really cool and how everything sort of interacts and like sort of like it's got a pseudo physics based setup. Um, and that kind of looks really performant and looks like a, it's like a really nice user experience to use. Um, so how could you do this yourself? Um, uh, I'm not sure how Stripe did it technically themselves, but there is a couple of tools uh, that I've seen. One called Bounce Chairs, and that allows you to do sort of like pseudo based physics animation. So you can do like springs and stuff interfere with each other, and uh, you get that sort of nice springy motion and natural sort of um, movement in your application. Um, and the web is capable of native performance. I hate using that word native performance, but they've sort of set the bar of what users expect. Um, but it's a lot harder on the web because it's really easy to degrade performance and not know why. Um, so that's kind of an animation side. So I'm going to go into sort of like a case study. Uh, this is like a little project I built and we had, I had a performance issue with it and I couldn't figure out what. So it's sort of like my journey and how I discovered what was going on and sort of what the browser does. Um, so uh, I read this library called scroll list view. Uh, so just a bit of background on it. It's kind of like a, the idea was it's a performance scrolling library. Uh, it's not like I scroll, it doesn't do like the bouncing stuff. But what it does is it, is it um, basically works like in iOS development, they've got the UI table view. Essentially, it'll display as many cells as it needs to to fit the viewport, and then only a few more either side. And as you scroll, it sort of reorders the cells. Um, and I'll, I'll show you an animation of that in a second. Uh, and mine uses the Flexbox order property. So rather than using like transform to or position absolute to reposition an element or even ripping it out of the DOM and replacing it down the bottom. Uh, we can rely on the algorithm that Flexbox has. Um, and this has more benefits where I can have variable height cells. So a lot of those, uh, a lot of the scrolling logs, you'll see that I always have a fixed height. Um, with the Flexbox order property, you can, you can uh, do some really cool stuff. Um, this is an uh, animated GIF. Um, you can see like, this is a Chrome tracing. So this is like a really low level tool. Um, but more importantly, I just wanted to show like how the scrolling works. So you can see up here, uh, as I scroll, the cells move down the bottom here. It's kind of replacing. And that's the Flexbox order property being changed on those elements. And so like, the screen's painting. And that's kind of like a 3D view. So that's the, the scroll container, and that's like the browser window you see. Um, and it gives you like a, a frame by frame look at what's going on in the browser. But it was a nice way to demonstrate what it's actually doing. Um, I wrote an article about this, so you can check out my blog, uh, The CSS Ninja, if you want to have a look. Um, but there was a, a problem. Um, so let me actually show you a live demo of it here. So you can see the, the scrolling here. I've got like a list item in here. So this initially has 20 items, but to just fill the viewport, it, it just renders eight list items. And you can see I've got the order property on there. So as I scroll, you can see that adjusts, and now that's down the bottom, so it's kind of just reordering as you go, and just adds a padding to the top, so you keep that scroll position. So you can scroll through a lot of stuff, um, and it works pretty well. Um, so, but there was a, so there was a performance problem with it. So uh, as I showed you there, it works pretty well, and it works fine. Um, I've even got an example of working on mobile, and it works, works well. So as you like normal 
as a user goes through their Facebook feed or Twitter feed, they sort of scroll at a, a steady pace. Um, but when you start to do high velocity sort of scrolling, so you get to the bottom of a list and then you want to scroll really quickly to the top, um, and you build momentum with the scroll, uh, the screen starts like whiting out, I say, because it, like, it just goes blank and doesn't render anything, and I, was, I didn't know why. Um, so I'll go back and I'll show you the demo. So if I drag a scroll bar, you can see it's kind of just whites out there, and I'm not sure why, and if I scroll a little bit, suddenly it repaints again, and it's kind of confusing why that's happening. Um, so as like steady pace, it's fine, but then when you start like really getting some movement happening, it sort of like renders whites out and something's going on. <clears throat> and that's the animated GIF showing it. So it's normal scrolling, and then as you drag it, you can see like it just gets white. Um, I'm sure it's going on there. So why is that? So to understand why, we need to sort of take a step back and understand the, the performance, the cost of changing a CSS property. Uh, there's, a, there's a few things that happen, and depending on what CSS property you change, different things happen. Um, really good website you should check out is cssstriggers.com. Uh, so this is, has basically like a nice little search tool. You can search for a CSS property, and it'll lay out and tell you, like, does it cause a paint, does it cause a reflow, uh, or does it just cause a composite? Um, and looking up the order property, essentially, the order, whenever you change it, update it, it causes a reflow and a paint, which is expensive in the browser. Um, and it needs to, if it needs to do a lot, then, then some things can happen. Um, essentially, the only really safe properties you can do where you're updating a lot are uh, transform, uh, so like scale, rotate, uh, translate, uh, and opacity are the only really safe ones to do because uh, what the browser does is that uh, composites it to the GPU and the GPU then handles that and there's no sort of reflow or paints happening. Um, if you're translating uh, elements using those two properties. Uh, otherwise, everything else is kind of detrimental and will, will, um, will degrade performance. And that's just a screen grab from the CSS triggers. So you can see, like, order on uh, when it initializes and when it updates, it causes a layout, paint, and a composite. Um, and you kind of want to stick to just properties that do composites for performance-based stuff. Uh, another side of it is knowing your paints versus reflow. So it's kind of rudimentary knowledge of the browser. Um, there's two different types. So a paint is like a non-geometric change. So that's when you change like, the background color or the background image, something that doesn't affect like the dimensions of the page. A reflow is the other side. So when you affect the, uh, the dimensions, so you change the font size, you change the margin, you go to border, et cetera, anything that where the, the browser needs to recalculate a lot of stuff. Um, and this is just an example of so the code. So toggling like visibility, that's just a paint because it's not um, it's a non-geometric change. Um, whereas toggling the font size will cause a paint and a reflow. So uh, it needs the reflow to calculate where everything's positioned now because the font size increased, and then it needs to paint it to the screen. Um, and then you can also have properties where you access where it forces the browser to do a reflow. So the browser tries to be intelligent, it tries to queue up a lot of this stuff for you, uh, but there's certain uh, bits where it has to like flush the queue and it has to like cause a reflow. So one of those is like offset left. So you, you have to get the correct dimension back. Um, otherwise the browser could be lying to you so they need to cause a reflow. So you kind of need to be careful with those properties. Um, and you can see here, this is a screenshot from the Chrome timeline dev tools and it kind of shows you what happens. So like you do a, you do a change, like the function call happens, it does a change, it recalculates the styles. Um, and then any of the properties like width, height, margin, left and top can cause a layout. Uh, any of the other properties in the green bar, um, this green bar here can cause like box shadow, border radius, uh, those things that don't uh, do a geometric change. And you can see lastly the composite layer, which is like transform and opacity. That's like handled by the GPU, so that's really fast. Um, so one of the key things you should do is batching. So you need to um, batch your reads and writes. So you don't want to read, write, read, write, read, write, otherwise the browser needs to reflow, repaint, reflow, repaint, and you get that sort of jank that a lot of people talk about. Um, so batch that up. So you only, want, you only want layout and paint to happen once per tick. So it's kind of like you um, will use something like request animation frame. So that works, that does the callback uh, every time the screen refreshes. So the average uh, refresh rate on the screen is like 60 hertz, and that's where that 60 frames a second comes from. So I kind of execute 60 times a second. So that way you can like queue up a lot of stuff and have it happen fast, and it won't like make your app seem slow because it's happening a lot. But you'll get like less of this what they call layout crashing. 
Um, so you want to control it and minimize. So the best way to do that is use a DOM abstraction, like because it's really easy to um, degrade performance. You kind of need an abstraction on top that's really thinking about that. Uh, React kind of paved the way in that thinking with their virtual DOM and kind of their representation of the DOM that you write, and they sort of handle writing to it, so it's pretty good. Ember has HTML bars, which is like a lot of similar thinking um, uh, to React, so they're kind of doing a lot of performance stuff there in their latest release. Um, if you don't use a, a application sort of framework, um, there's a library called FastDOM, which hooks into like request animation frames. So all your reads and writes to the DOM, you do through this library, and that'll batch it up and, and do it in a performant way for you. Um, if you can't opt into a framework, it's a pretty good one. Uh, so how do we measure UI performance? Um, uh, recently, so for a long time, it was only really Chrome that offered the ability to do that. Um, but now, like IE11, Safari, and Firefox all have really great support for extracting performance, for seeing what's painting, what's reflowing, and kind of giving like a frame rate. Um, they all, all, all offer a timeline. Um, I just checked out IE11's uh, tools, and they're like really, really good. They're up there with Chrome for getting performance uh, information out of like your website and they give it a, a really nice interface for it. So let's, let's go back to that issue of, of the scrollless view was whiting out um, and we can sort of discover what's going on. Uh, so first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll timeline in Chrome um, and this will, uh, like I showed in the other screenshot, it'll show you like the reflows, paints and it'll give you like a frame rate thing. Um, but when we do that, and I'll show you a screenshot of uh, a profile I took, um, it doesn't eliminate why the whiteout is happening. For, as far as the timeline's concerned, it looks like it's really performant. It's not doing much. The browser is like handling okay. But it doesn't uh, um, make it clear why suddenly everything's disappearing off the page. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't help. Uh, and that's the same for all the browsers. They kind of say it's ticking on at 60 frames a second. Um, and you think every, everything according to the timeline is fine, but it's still, you can see it's not fine because it's um, not displaying the data. Um, so that's a, a timeline I did of the scrolling thing. You can see it's, it's below the 60 frame a second, which is up here, so you want to be below this line. So that's ticking along, and then you can see sort of the bars happening there. It's like doing some paints and composites, and then they're really small, and they're happening really fast. Um, but it's still a problem. So it doesn't, doesn't always help. Um, so this is where Safari sort of has some really hidden tools. For a long time, uh, this feature called Show Compositing Borders was hidden behind a flag. You had to launch uh, Safari in the, in the command line to get it happening, but now they've exposed it in their debug menu, and I'll show that in a second. Um, I'll show that now. Refresh that. One second. This one. Okay. So to show this, this uh, you can see it's got these um, borders. And essentially, um, these are like the, the textures that are uploaded to the GPU. And it kind of gives you some numbers here. So you can expose that by going to debug, uh, draw compositing flags, and then down here, show. So it's kind of hidden behind these, these menu options, but you can get to it. But what it, what it actually illuminates is as I scroll, you can see that number is increasing a lot. Um, what that means is that's uploading a texture to the GPU like, every time, and it's happening a lot because we're updating the order property. So like, if I start to scroll that really fast, you get the wider happening and you see like the number increases exponentially. Um, and that's that's kind of like what, what is happening um, in the browser. So it uh, shows the textures are being sent to the GPU um, and that number should be small. Uh, so if that's big, then you've got, a, you've got an issue where like the GPU is getting overloaded. Um, things here, I'll take a screenshot here. Essentially what we're doing is we're flooding the GPU. So kind of a good analogy is like a, a big sports game in a stadium's uh, finished and all the crowd is coming out to the door, it kind of really slows down. So you're trying to upload way too many textures to the, the GPU and it just can't handle it. It just just wipes out and it just like stops rendering and it can't keep up because you're doing too much uh, for it to handle. Um, and you just, you're, you're technically overlaying the GPU bus 
um, with too many textures for it to handle properly to be able to, to paint to the screen in the browser. Um, and that's, the, that's how we have our answer uh, to the whiteout. So it's kind of a bit of a journey. The, the tools are a bit immature to get to it and they're kind of hidden behind probably some confusing names. Um, but once you start to learn it, they make a lot more sense. There's a good article about this very subject of using that to debug performance uh, in Safari. Um, and basically the conclusion we come to is the order property isn't a performant option when you want to do high velocity scrolling. Like it has a lot of other benefits, but when it comes to like whiting out, it's kind of like a no-go. So it's kind of like you have to avoid it, um, but it offers so much, which is unfortunate. Um, so it's not easy, like the dev tools are still immature, whether they where they do excel is, you know, inspecting and looking at CSS and JavaScript profiling, but in a lot of like the UI performance stuff, there's still like some some blank areas where they don't cover like where, where where you kind of get stuck is only because Safari exposed that that I was able to discover what was actually happening. Um, otherwise, I'd just be I wouldn't know what what was going on. Um, and high performance uh, user interfaces are really hard. Um, on the web especially, because it's so easy to degrade. Like you can do simple things like just change a CSS property and then suddenly like everything comes crashing down. Um, but it's not impossible. Um, so like I said before, if you want to do native like performance really fast, then you, you kind of need to use an abstraction where they're really thinking about this for you and you kind of just define your application. Uh, and a really good one that I've seen lately is called Famous. Um, it kind of stews all these ideas into software extraction where they really think about performance. Um, uh, and you sort of describe your application in JavaScript and it sort of handles the rendering to the DOM for you. Um, and they, so they use a number of strategies. So they, they use a flat DOM. So the DOM structure is really like flat. So it's easy for the style recalculation to happen. So the more complex the DOM you have, the more work the browser has to do when it needs to recalculate the styles because it needs to traverse all the nodes uh, in your document. Um, they use a pressed animation frame to do it 60 times a second. They make sure everything's put onto the GPU, so they use uh, the matrix 3D transform. And they also have a built-in physics engine, so you can get that nice stuff. Uh, so that, where, where I was dragging my head around before, that was using the famous thing, so you can get like the sort of spring physics happening. Um, and it's really quite good. Uh, the other benefit is too, is because you describe it in their, in their framework, you can render it to other uh, endpoints. So you, you can render to DOM, you can do SVG, and they even have WebGL, so that sort of boosts the performance again, and you can start to do more uh, cool animations within WebGL that's not possible in the DOM. So you can do like cloth based stuff and whatnot. Um, so performance is fragile. Uh, it's very easy, as I've said many times, to degrade performance. Uh, you really need to put an abstraction in front. Um, hand rolling will always end in tears. So like, if you're working by yourself, maybe that will work for you. But if you're in a team, uh, really trying to like not degrade performance is really hard when you're working with many people. Um, and basically, the DOM is the worst. It's the worst for performance. It's not, it was never intended to do like the sort of application level stuff that we're doing now. But it's what we've got to work with. So um, we have to work with it. Um, but what we really need is the web platforms kind of needs this low level control. So people who really want to extract the most performance out of their web apps, they really kind of need the trust from the browser. They, they, they know what they're doing. So there's a few things where you could control. You could isolate something on the page to know, to say, I know when it needs to paint and when it needs to reflow. Um, but that's sort of not available. There's, there's is some specifications, like there's a CSS containment specification, which you can isolate uh, some stuff to do that. But that's all early days and just, just uh, it's not even in any browsers. Um, so yeah, isolated components. Pretty much we need the functionality of an iframe, but without the baggage. Um, so iframe has obviously has a lot of uh, baggage around it. We kind of need the benefits of that, um, but in a, in a nicer way. Uh, so we can do, we can start getting, we can start extracting really good performance out of it. Uh, and that's it. Thanks. You're working with Ember at Zendesk, right? Uh, yeah, yep. Do you have issues with reflowing? We've got a bunch of um, uh, tabbing issues where things don't come in at the right time or seem a bit slow. I was wondering, are you doing personal optimizations or is there just changes to Ember that are going through that are going to speed stuff up? 
Uh, so I, I don't work with that day to day, but um, I think HTML bars kind of like fixes a lot of the problems that the the other templating engine they used previously. Um, they're kind of taking some cues from React. With it. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, with um, all the amazing performance that you've shown, do you think there's reason to be optimistic enough to to think that um, web applications will at some point become better than native in terms of performance? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm pretty optimistic about it. I think I think the it's capable there. Like, there's a lot of work being done in discovering performance issues as well as like helping increase performance. So, um, like a lot of like the frameworks are kind of like fixing that for us by attracting us away from that like fine tuning. They're they're working on the fine tuning. Um, as to whether we ever get like native, uh, maybe we'll be close. Um, you know, Mozilla is doing a lot of work with their Asm JS for high-performing games uh, in the browser. Um, JavaScript's getting faster and faster all the time, uh, and you know, the enabling. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty hopeful that the web will be like the the one true place. Uh, I hope. Yeah. Hi. Um, that was an awesome talk. Can you you mentioned a little bit about how the Safari Dev Tools uh, let you let you see repaints, but then there's stuff in the Chrome Dev Tools. Do you have like a suggestion of your preferred workflow of like you prefer developing in Chrome or in Safari or? So yeah, I, I tend to mix between Firefox and and Chrome, like Chome because they were kind of the first ones to, to surface that sort of timeline user interface performance stuff. Um, and I've only just been recently looking into Safari because they've got some extra stuff that other browsers don't uh, that's really focused on like seeing what's happening with the GPU, like when you're doing a lot of transform stuff. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I mostly uh, work in Chrome with my workflow. I don't really, I kind of just I jump around browsers depending on what I need to discover. Um, it'd be kind of nice to have like a unified sort of dev tools approach, um, but that's, that's probably a long way away. 